keep the concept, and then you've got to get them hands on, get them out in the field, to practice those concepts. And not only that, be fair to yourself. Remember, because you laid out a concept, doesn't mean you have it all right the first time. You may think it through. So if you see things happen, you say, okay, now we've got to take the practice, go back to the concept, and revise the concept. You go back and forth until it works after you do a number of cases. So then they get that, now they're getting the finger spits in the field the Germans talk about, because you're giving them the practice. And I congrats. Uh, I think what we tend to do in the military is we want, once we understand the concept, that we want some sort of a tool, a prescriptive tool, to make it work. And that's when you begin to get in trouble. That's right. What I'm saying is you have a concept, let the guys try it under different circumstances out there. And don't let the officers or, or, the, or the leaders interfere too much. Just give them the task, let the other guy do it. He's going to screw it up, let him screw it up so you can learn what the screw up is, then have your critique afterward. And that's how you learn. Implied in that standard yeah. with see, instead, everybody sets up so nobody nobody screws up. Fuck them. I want to see a lot of screw ups. So it's going to be force on force. That's right. You want to see yeah. a lot of screw ups because you're not sure what are going to be the screw ups, what aren't. Because all you got is a concept. It might turn out some good, some are bad. And that, that's how that's part of the thing. So that's how you get that finger spits into fuel. So, so, so stay away from the prescription. I would. In academia, we only go so far, sir. You got to get out there. Where's the force? Let me give you a good well example in area well. combat. Here's a fighter pilot back there. Okay, we go through a long ritual. We started at Nellis many years ago. Before then, they had a favorite maneuver. We taught them all these fundamental maneuvers. High-speed yo-yos, low-speed yo-yos, barrel roll attacks, diving spirals, uh, uh, what do you call it, pirouettes. Uh, Christ, I can't remember why I was so deeply involved in them. And the guy's trying, I said, don't try to remember that stuff for <laughs> Christ's sakes. Said, don't even think of it. You try to remember, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, am I going to steer the wheel this much in the car? You, don't even, how far do you, you know how far you're going to turn the wheel when you turn You don't even think about it. Or how far are you going to push the accelerator down, or how far are you going to, you know, I said, what you have to do is we're going to go out there and we're going to teach you that so after a while it becomes part of your finger space. We teach them the maneuvers. What you do and why you do it. Then we take them out and work it over again and again and again. Pretty soon you don't even have to think about it. And so you don't have to worry about the goddamn manual. You just do it. That's why I'm saying if you teach the concept you don't give them the hands on, they're never going to get the finger space and fuel. So even though we didn't know the term at the time, what we were teaching the fighter pilots was finger space and fuel. So they could do those things. They could do the chops, the counter chops, the maneuvers, the counter maneuvers, the yo-yos when they had it, the low speed, the high speed, the scissors, the vertical rolling scissors, etc. You know what I'm talking about. It's true. <laughs> and you, they got to have those fundamentals. They don't have it. They're going to be dog meat for everybody else. The guy's going to come in and say, "What should I do?" He's out. <laughs> so it's got to be. He's got to be right there. He can't think about what page number is that on what manual so and so and get the checklist out. That's bullshit. He either has it now or he doesn't have it. Period. So you got to give them that again and again, give them that practice. And pretty soon they get, I'll tell you, these guys get good. They're not even sure how they get good, but they get good. I think our dumb is within the school environment, we're limited in the way we can accomplish that. War game, that exercise. Well, I understand that. And then actual hands-on, of course, will have to take place. Yeah, but when you get out to your units, you should do that all the time. Yes, when you get out to your units, I mean, I agree. You're going through a school. You don't have the time. We didn't have the time to teach them all that in the fighter the weapons school. No, so we gave it to them. We kept back to the units. We kept, we kept cycling through again and again. We'll get guys out there. And so pretty soon they start getting what we now call finger spitzing. And that's what you want to have your officers and your men to get. So when they get out there, they just got that goddamn feeling. Like, take those son of bitches out. But if you're just treating the concept on a, like here on a chart, it's bullshit, you know, in burn the guard. you got to practice it. And you've got to do not only that, do it every different way you can think of. And you should not grade a guy because he does it a different way. He says, bullshit, that wasn't a school solution. Half, you're out. <clears throat> I don't care what's different. If he, if he realizes tasks and it works out good, say, hey, it's good. I wonder why that worked. He can explain it. Fine. That's another option. You want to keep widening that rep repertoire. You want to make that repertoire as wide as possible. Because you become more unpredictable. The wider your repertoire, that means you've got a wide angle lens. The other guy's got the narrow angle lens. You've got the wide band. He's looking at things through the narrow band. Things, you got the wide band filter. You want him to have the narrow band filter. That you hit on. And that here at the school, the answer to, and I want to go with the answer to the colonel's question is, is that training is repetition. And the more that you do something, and the more that you're exposed to something, whether it's a math exercise, where you have to make a decision, you have to have input in, you have experience, therefore you're going to generate output. So in the academic environment, the more that you can expose yourself to that type of rapidity and weight of, of but remember, you got to be very better off than you are otherwise. No, you're very good, except for one thing you got to keep in mind, which is, I have another part, another one with you. Whenever you do that, you always want to do it so you have a variety of different circumstances when you're doing it. If you don't do that, 
Then pretty soon you're choreographing things with a narrow repertoire and you're going to get cleaned out when you're thrown in another environment. And there's a very big danger of people like to look good so they have this narrow, this narrow repertoire. You want to say, you want to throw different things at it, <coughs> as many as you can, so they're developing a, a rip, I mean, a finger spits that can feel across a wide spectrum. I I can't come and, you know, I, you know, I, I, I really, I can't overemphasize that. This is crucial, because this is what makes you adaptable and unpredictable. Remember, I keep using those words. Those are the two key words, be adaptable and unpredictable. And then you'll gain leverage, because the moment you start becoming rigid, or non-adaptable and predictable, you know, the game's over. <laughs> over. And that's the danger if you're doing it with very narrow repertory because you want to look good, you know, everybody to the commander because we all practice this one goddamn drill. Well, you choreograph it. Let me come from the top of an academic department. Concepts. Well, you can't do an academic, but you can give them at least the basic stuff so they can go out and do it themselves. We should be looking at it. You see what I'm saying? Well, I think we're probably going to give them a sense in terms of map drills. Fair enough. The concept, some very, very general tools. That's right. Back then, the next exercise. That's right. Exercise and map drills are good, but then you want to set up the map drills, you know, many different ways, too. And in the end, they still got to connect up with the actual operation when they get out in their own unit. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so they can actually develop the fingers, bits, and the fuel. I, I can't overemphasize that. <clears throat> But the other guy not had the fingers physically fuel. That feels good. You're cleaning his clock, and he doesn't. He can't even figure out why. Maybe you can't either, but you know you're doing it. What you're saying is, the, the, I think. What do you mean, Carl? You're going to expose us. That's right. If it's exposure, you're not going to teach us. You're going to expose us to why. Sure, I think well, we, would have, we would have made a mistake if we spent a hell of a lot of time on staff planning. We'd loosen up the staff planning stuff. Uh, and do more, add some more exercise. Well, you know, we've only done staff planning once, and that's it. First uh, year. I, I think instead of throwing some different models at you, we throw you one simple model. Yes, sir. Yeah. You threw three or four different models. I mean, one, one thing I think, I think many staff pilots are exposed to an awful lot of material. I don't think we were taught very much. I just think we, we have the exposure, we have the references to go to. The other thing I think, I think, Training military, training and military education are two different things. Oh, yeah. They're not they're not one of the same. And then I think the problem with having hands all the time is, is time itself. Heck yeah, that's how you get that's, the that's you gotta get see because then you're what you're doing is you're taking your, your concepts, your ideas, and your training, and you're you're putting it all together and you get that finger spitting the field. That's what you want to get. But the time we we fight the time. The time is our end. I understand. It. He can't do everything. But at least he can expose these things. Yes, in the end, when you go on the field, yet we couldn't do anything to cut our weapons, but we get him exposed. Say, now you guys got to practice your job. We can't do that for you. We're going to give you so much. You show you the different combination. Well, that's, 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 that's only give the concept. And then all he does is go. That's right. Goes at the site, and someone says, "Hey, that's we right. need you. Show us how to do it." I think you, gotta, you can't give a prescription. You got to get the foot in the door. How to do it? Now, you can't give him a prescription. You're doing that. Then it, you know it's a choreograph. You really can't do that. I mean, I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. I just don't. I don't see how that works. Yeah, you're a I don't think we disagree. Yeah. Great. There's a question that always needs to be answered, or at least discussed, somewhere along the line, which is uh, who is ultimately responsible for the success of any operation? You have to work that out once you come to that. Well, the commander has to take responsibility. In the end, it's his responsibility. In the end, it's the commander's responsibility. responsibility. It's his responsibility. He can't throw. He can't throw that off. I don't think he can throw that off. Right. Well, what if a lower guy screws up? I said, "Well, they work for you." My responsibility in this case, I meant um, the execution. Who, who actually executes it is responsible. And then whoever executes it, whoever does the how. But the higher level guys have some responsibility you know, in a sense because he, you know, laid out the mission. As a uh, as an organization, yeah, we push that responsibility down to the law, the lowest man. And I think it, it uh, the philosophy can have a tendency to. Oh, I see what you're getting at. Okay, no, that's good. We keep responsibility defined as no, no, no. <laughs> That's not what I mean. And, uh, the, the, the men below, whatever that, where we draw that line of responsibility, at whatever rank, the level below that 
ceases to operate. We all have to be responsible. No, you're, you got a good point. No, I agree with that. That's, that's, I'm just saying, at the end, the commander can't absolve himself from responsibility. But I was looking for the commander. But what you want to do is make the people down below more and more responsible. And that has to be done. That's very important. In other words, they got to feel like they're part of the you know, thinking process, the action, that too. And that's exactly what you're suggesting. I agree with you. What can make responsible for? Hold them accountable. Hold them accountable. accountable, that's right. You got to hold them accountable. They're responsible for the commander. Yeah. Well, there's no problem. I didn't see what he's getting at. I see what you're getting at. That's a very it's, a, it's a dangerous, it's a tricky thing. But what, what do you want? Do you want a bunch of goddamn automatons working for you down here? No, no. It doesn't work. A bunch of automatons is bullshit. And that's what you're saying. That doesn't work. You can't do it. I mean, you may think you can, but it's not going to work. You know, I'm just taking the opposite extreme. <laughs> You know, I continually uh, relate this to the athletic field of endeavors and my limited successes on those fields. Uh, as I look back in retrospect, uh, I wasn't thinking. Once I started thinking, I started reacting to the situation. It became in a reactive role. That goes back to the field. Which you always want to get. hard to acquire, though. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, I didn't say it was easy. No way. That's right. It takes time. But that's why you want to look at the variety do it different and do it different ways. See, so in the end, you know you you know when you're doing something that just feels good. And it's because you've accumulated all the experience you say, hey, this is right. You don't even know why. I mean all those connections in your brain, you've done it on many different ways. And not only if it doesn't work out right, you know you know, even if it doesn't work out, you got about five or six off you start you start shifting here. You better probably do that naturally. I mean, boy, they start shifting gears real quick if they're any good. Mm -hmm. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. They're maneuvering one piece of gear. I understand that. The land combat's more difficult. I'll agree with that. On the other hand, you made it a little bit too simple. They may be over one piece of gear. Remember, there's a lot of guys out there, and they've got to work with their buddies. As well as trying to take out the other guy, and it's just very, you all have to work a super finger space and get fuel together so they can build that harmony so they can do that. In the end, though, your job's tough. I'll agree with that. No, I, I, there's no way I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that. Yours is tough. Because the sense they have more, it's easier for them to operate during the ground many other things you've got problems with. It's a tougher job than that. But some of those things they learn in a simple situation, you can take advantage of and take aspects of it and use it in a more complicated situation like in land warfare uh, or ground combat. The Germans, did it. they use the word. Rommel uses it. Figure it. It's amazing how they all use it. They want to get that, that sure feel. You got off track, didn't you? Okay. What is this? Huh? John, the key idea is supporting mechanism. Remember, we already talked about three years ago. Generalize the black order. Note this. That's a key idea. Divide the inner subordinate components into three. So he said, ideally, the three subdivisions. The wing, two wings in the center, you can go with two wings, or three wings left and right center. But he said, the basic idea is three. You have some way of thinking about it, trying to give you a mechanism. So you can avoid these strategic grand patterns. And the importance of setting up base and operational line of communication. Not only that, so you can shift them and shift them. I mean, you can change them and shift them. So you can actually gain leverage out of these maneuvers. And a strategy grand tactics. Note this by great rapid movements carry vulgar forces against fractions in them. Well, that's an important statement in a sense. If you're not free and rapid, how are you going to get your strength against the weakness? You're not going to be able to. So once again, the speed in a sense is a higher principle than the idea of concentration. He in a sense says that right in the statement. And all all the clause was brought out, he's trying to say the other. Okay, strike in the most decisive direction. And I got a copy of this one. You can say against the center or one wing or the center and one wing simultaneously. Remember, I got two things grouped together strategy and grand tactical or the operational. In the strategic sense, you can go against the center or one wing because you're spread out. In the grand tactical sense, you can go against the center and one wing simultaneously. That's going to be popular. And otherwise, all the other ones stack up pretty much the same. And he recognized the importance of season this communication. In other words, cutting off the resupply, cutting off from support that people tend to panic when they lose their support. Again. Start doing dumb things. Force the fight in a reverse front. <laughs> the enemy's force is too much extended. <laughs> we saw that earlier in Napoleonic Maneuver. 
A lot of flying can turn and win. Hit the enemy in the flank and also can uh, contain him at the front. That's Pat, you know, pull him by the nose and kick him in the hand. He might have read John and got it out. I don't know. <coughs> okay, very much like a lot of flying can fall from the enemy in the flank and also can contain him at the front. Pull him by the nose, kick him in the hand. Note this statement. Attack may be simultaneous on both, uh, on both extremities, but not when the attacking force is equal to the enemy. Well, there's too many counterexamples to that. That doesn't stand out. Even Napoleon, Dresden, pulled it off. You look at Kanai and many other ones of the damn things done. Just too many counterexamples to that. It doesn't work out. But if you look at it more carefully, the way he's writing it, what he's really doing, he's juxtaposing the uh, double envelopment versus single envelopment. Basically, what he's saying is you can get the same leverage with less force out of a single development scheme as opposed to a double development. Basically, that's what he's saying. But if you look at it in, way, in a very rigid sense, it, it doesn't sort of hold together. Okay. And then his aim was what he called make evidence the, succe- the secret for success. Make evidence the secret for success in war. He's not trying to give you a secret success. He's just trying to give you a way of thinking about it so you can deal with these complexities. And that's what he's really saying when he uses the word. But now we can take... Uh, Germany. Okay, preoccupation with formal operation, arrangement based, in other words, very formal, very rigid. Also, a lack of appreciation for the use of loose triggers, swans, or grows, and skirmishes to mask. I mean, heck, you can put them down. He didn't have really much to say. They sort of put down statements. And likely result, we can stare at He has some good ideas, but we've got to really throw away the rigid lattice work. And put up. We keep on the lattice work to get some rigid ideas. <laughs> In any case, if we tie them all together, the Polian classes and Germany, the key point here is they really didn't appreciate the importance of irregular attack arrangement activity. In other words, you look at, as I say here, the Polian classes and Germany, you need to find one top down, emphasize the depth of the top, and the regularity at the bottom. And I made the point, I said, that's one of those pervasive influences that came forward to the present day. One of my great an army colonel got up and he says, You're wrong. Says, Why? He said, Because today we've got regularity at both top and bottom. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's very good. So, so why did that occur? As the first case, that's what happened. But why did they, why did they gravitate? That? Remember Napoleon himself, even though he's a product of the revolution, he's also reinstalled the aristocracy, where, you know, the aristocracy wants to control those people's law. So he did that. Plus the fact is he got a large empire there. He had these foreign troops. So he wanted to be able to also control them. So those kind of things happen. So in a sense, by his own conquest and by his own uh, elevating his own positions, he starts doing the kind of things that the people did before him that allowed him in order to take them down. I guess you can go back to Lord Acton's statement. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Was that because he increased, I mean, he, he, his size increased? Uh, well, yeah, he was trying to run the whole empire, and of course he had his, he had his allied, you know, the Prussians, the other people that were supposed to be subver- subservient to them, and so he had to put down stringent rules upon them, he wanted to be able to control them. Obsession for control. Obsession for control, that's what we're talking about. And the more you try to control people, guess what? The less control you get. It's like a paradox. In other words, the more you try to constrain your activities, the more people resist that, and the less control you really get. And that's why the sergeant had a very good point. His point was, we've got to make the people responsible below. If they feel like they're part of the action, they got the things to do. We're not going to treat them like automatons. But the more you try to treat them like automatons, that's, obs- that's obsession for control. That doesn't necessarily mean the less control you get of the people. You might have them under control, but the less control you have of the situation. That's right. It's so it's deceiving. You think That's they right. control. They control. really don't have it. They really don't have it. That's right. It's like a paradox. It's exactly right. It's like a paradox. It's like a paradox. It's not exactly right. Try to keep those things in mind all the time. It's like discipline. What you really you don't want to <laughs> be able to be able to discipline people. What you want inculcate in them is a sense of self discipline. Because then you have discipline. If you always have to discipline people you got a problem. You want to be able to set things up so that you, inside themselves they build up a sense of self-discipline. 
that's what time. And that's what you want to do as a commander or a leader. Be able to inculcate in them with a sense of self because then you're a real commander, you're a real leader. And not only that, you have real control in it. So when you developed this, was it, was it keep recalling rationale while you looked at these three? Not that people don't mind it because they feel like they're part of the team. So I'm saying, good. When you develop this, was there, do you recall the rationale why you just limited to these three theorists, or did you look at Oh, I just, I was, remember I said historical snapshots. Right. I just said, that, since these were the principal theorists out of the 19th century, Napoleon, Clausewitz, and Jomini, I wanted to focus on them, because they had such a pervasive influence upon what we do today, that's why I did it. They're not the only ones, other guys that you know, make comments too, but these had, you know, very important influence. I mean, I can't do the whole military history, somebody can always bring up another one. That's why I call it historical snapshots. I just find it interesting. I think Dupree just added Mahan to it. He used the same three and then he added Mahan. Okay, let me raise a question. Mahan, that's very interesting. Let's talk about both Mahan and Corbin. Because they're the <coughs> naval theorists. You'd be in the Marines, you've got to bring that up. Well, where did Mahan get his ideas? That's uh, from Jomini. Where did Corbett get his ideas? <coughs> from both Jomini and Clausewitz. Yeah. And Mahan. Corbett got it from all three. The point is. It's interesting, the so-called naval theorists got their ideas from the army theorists. Period. Now, they're up front about it. I mean, they didn't play about it. I mean, you know, Jomini's very up front where he got his ideas. I mean, excuse me, Mahan's very up front where he got his ideas. And so is Corp. They're very up front about it. In other words, you know, they say, hey, these guys got some good ideas. But it also, these ideas can be modified somewhat and be applied to naval warfare as well as land warfare. So, you know, there was no plagiarism. They just said, but, you know, these are good ideas and they can be applied in this context as well as that context. So I don't want anybody to think that they stole it. You know, because they were up front about it. So the Queen probably finally read a naval book and figured out, ah, damn, you know, <laughs> after you retired. <laughs> I got the picture. <laughs> In fact, I've used that in an argument. They say, why don't you look at naval warfare? They don't have to. Because I'm looking at the same guys the naval warfare guys use in order to build up naval warfare. I remember that, so that's good. <laughs> that's good, I remember that. Sir. You can use that against them. I gave sure. you a good enough. Huh? Okay, here's another theorist at the time. And what he did, he was very deep. He said he was deeply influenced by John. He's, in fact, he was in Philadelphia, Emil Shaw. You know what he wrote in 1862 in the Civil War? And he said, here, there are three great maxims common to the whole science of organization. Now, and they're not unfamiliar, you've seen them before. And of course, I had a little cautionary note there at the bottom. That's my cautionary note on it. And two things. While these can uh, maximize short in a general way, no one underlined physical maneuvers. Don't bring out the physical maneuvers, the moral maneuvers. So I underline that. That can be used to realize. Also, they do not address the non adaptability for degrees of the drill regulation mindset that permeated in the 19th century. Maneuvers at the tactical point, but quotes around the maneuvers. They didn't look much like maneuvers. Seems they were rather rigid. There's some interesting books how that was done. In fact, there's a book, uh, anybody ever read Forward into Battle? And there's another book, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but one by, uh, uh, the one that the two guys wrote uh, about the, the Southern. Oh, McQuiney and Jamie. Hey, what's the name of that? Tack and, Tack and Die. Tack and Die. You want to read that very carefully. There's some interesting things in there. They got a lot of quotes. And there's a couple cases in there where a so-called attack broke down. Note the words. They really didn't break down. But they lost all their goddamn uniformity and rigidity, and the goddamn guys floated in the enemy lines and everywhere when they won. And they sat there mystified. How did that happen? And then they went back to their old ways again, tried to pound it home, and they couldn't. And some of the ones were breaking, what they thought were breaking down were actually succeeding. What they didn't realize was the ambiguity and the sense that the guys couldn't deal with it fluidity. And so they focused on the wrong thing. Not only that, Jomini had the answer and refused the answer. You want to read Jomini's book, The Art of War, where he's talking about cavalry. And what he's doing, he juxtaposes the, uh, the Cossacks versus the French cavalry. And he talks about, he says, they seem to operate in a regular fashion. You don't know how they're operating, but they seem to have a common purpose. And he makes comment upon the fact that Lloyd, who preceded him, saw that really the Cossacks were a better cavalry than all the other cavalry because of it. And then John, who looks at this, he said he agreed with him. He said, but how would we all know the regular cavalry? So he voted He voted against the evidence. He had all the evidence and voted the other way. So we're going to have these guys in these eight formations. So here these other guys had the evidence where these guys were floating in and filtrating the lines because the attack broke down. They said, bullshit, we're going back the other way and blow everybody away. 
200 report of federal tides in here. I realized, God, here's the, they don't even read their own reports. It was right there, right in front of their eyes. Couldn't see it. Because they were they had preconceptions, presuppositions in their mind. From those goddamn drill regulations. They said the attack broke down, but it succeeded. Well, the attack didn't break down, because it did succeed. Their formations broke down, and because their formations broke down, it did succeed. That was the answer. The attack didn't break down, the formations broke down. Because they broke down, they were able to succeed. Incorrect interpretation. You saw those, didn't you? Remember that, Mike? You saw the answer. I said, geez, here it is. Plain as day. They're quoting right out of that. I said, boy, these are quoting. This is beautiful stuff. Okay. Impact of that. Let's go up now. Of course, the 19th century saw the impact of a lot of modern technology. I want to bring that in. And we see these as key ingredients. We're able to tell about a quick fire artillery machine gun repeating like a part of modern trend. And the early trends. Emphasis on mass fire fire. Supported by radio just increased emphasis on fully deep into heavy. And but they still use these frontal assaults by large stereotype engine formation. In other words, they didn't break them down into small units and try to And the result is not just fine. Since because the way they're operating is suppressing the ambiguity set in the since they suppress that, they suppress, suppress surprise, the result is you get a bug there. <laughs> So now if we tie it all together, the influence of Napoleon caused us some Germany plus 19th century technology, we see, boy, that really all comes together. They really denied the opportunity to exploit these kind of things with police surprise. Well, it's done in all these wars. The American Civil War all the way down to the second half of the 19th century, obviously. The American Civil War all the way down to the uh, World War I. And the point I'm trying to make here is the evolution of tactics did not keep pace with the increase of weapons of faculty produced by the 19th century technology. So it raises a rather interesting question. Why would 19th century and early 20th century command unable to evolve better tactics to avoid over a half century debilitating casualties? Now I'm going to pretend we're back in the 19th century, we don't know that answer. We're going to answer that question after we get to the world. <coughs> right now we're we'll we're all dummies. We're going to answer it. I'm going to delay the answer. Okay. So now, what other influence came out in the 19th century? The result of capitalism. The impact of 19th century capitalism on this right. Remember, all that technology produced by capitalism, capitalism itself. At the beginning. So the impact of 19th century capitalism. This right from revolution. And the key idea to look up here is the idea now we begin to see struggle between, I mean, within social systems rather than between the social systems. <coughs> we're going to begin to see the beginning of today we call the world war. And here's the trend, it's not too surprising. And the result. So it raises a rather interesting question. And we're not just looking from an army viewpoint, we also want to look at it from what we call you know, social view. This conflict exists there, as we well know. Not just between four armies. Okay? And of course, we'll go back to the pretend we're Marxist. You know what I say with the Marxian flavor? I don't know what we're doing. Any idea the only way out of the situation dictated to the proletariat? None of them spoke this. Of course, they didn't have a dictator. It turns out they didn't have a dictatorship of the proletariat. Instead, they had a dictatorship over the proletariat. In other words, they have a little mismatch between promises and reality, also. Rather serious mismatches. In fact, as a result of that, remember, Marxism looked very good, and communism looked very good before it was tested. After it's tested, it's going through the test now, all of a sudden they find out it didn't work. I mean, they're going through extraordinary hop, skips, and jumps trying to get their system sorted out. Okay, necessary conditions for success. Note this crisis. You see that in your literature all the time. You've got to get a crisis. In fact, I always make the point in science. I use the point. You know, science depends upon anomalies. Without anomalies, you don't need to work on And if you don't pay attention to anomalies, then you get mismatch. If you don't pay attention to mismatch, you get crisis. So I'm saying without anomalies, no mismatch. Without mismatches, no crisis. Without crisis, no change. People don't do a goddamn thing unless there's a crisis, perceived or otherwise. And then, then they may not do it. You see, they recognize that crisis is important because that crisis is, can also can be a danger, but as the Chinese say, it's also what? An opportunity. That's exactly right. It's also an opportunity. <coughs> and the vanguard. Note the vanguard. They 
always bring up there. What's the vanguard? First, they said, you look at how many people read the uh, Communist Manifesto? Probably some of you read it. You're talking about the proletariat being the vanguard of the revolution. And later on, they start talking about the Communist Party being a, uh, the vanguard of the proletariat. And then later on, they start talking about the Central Committee being a vanguard of the Communist Party. And then the Politburo being a vanguard of, you've got the thing, in other words, a very, very tight control over a very large ship. Vanguard inside, vanguard inside. <coughs> Hierarchy. And here's how it works. Why? Because what happens is the crises then build up the vanguard. The vanguard then exploit the crises. You get this incestuous feedback loop, you pull the whole thing apart from the inside. It's in all their literature. But if you read American literature, we don't even talk about that. But nevertheless, they keep bringing this up over and over again. And the key inside. I think we've been here too long. You want to throw the towel in the night? We didn't get I want to get up to World War One, but I don't think Let's just finish this up there. One more page. It's one page, and then let's do World War One and one other page. I want to get through that. So we tie it all together. This is the problem. Here's the beginning story. Okay, tomorrow night we'll start with WW1. Any questions before we depart? We got off track a few times, but I enjoyed it. I hope you did. What were you talking about? Folks? Yeah, we'll talk about more about that. I'm not getting into it much right now. We left off, and we left off at the. Uh... Yeah, Side, and when I'm done, I'll move to the other side. I'm not out of business. Oh, guess I'm not already. Okay. That's all right. Okay. How's that? That pretty good or is that bad? Do I have it good? Good. <clears throat> Before we uh, continue, I'll ask you some questions. With the, any, any questions from last night? We can dive right on. We're kind of all we want to do is we want to pick it up from now and we'll go with the WW1 on. Any other questions? Yes. Last night? Evening? Okay, let's launch then. What I want to do now, continue to discuss. Sir, <coughs> could you uh, go over here and give or explain to me about center of gravity? So we got confused on that last night. We started going through that. You didn't like the term? Start talking well, about let, me, let me go back to what Clausewitz used it. He said, you know, if you go back to the, uh, I don't have that chart, I want to dig back in there, but if you go back to that chart where Clausewitz used it, I'm back to Clausewitz. Well, if you recall, he said it's where the mass is concentrated most densely. That's just not true. The center of gravity, you, you know, like I said, you know, you're going into, so there is no mass in the hollow steel wall. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's not really short. Mass is it's really bad once you accept that. I want to say, say we accept his definition. Let's just say whether we believe it or not, we're just going to accept it. Period. Right now, if you accept that, and that's what mass concentrates most densely, then you go after that. Then you got strength against strength. That's what the mass is concentrated most densely. So that's what he says. And we're going to go after that. So you're going right after the mass, strength against strength. It throws you right into that. And it doesn't have to be. It's all still wrong. It's really that connectivity that makes it, uh, things to hold together. As long as you can destroy that connectivity. You can pull it apart. And that's why I say public opinion is so important, like in Vietnam War, to pull this out of Vietnam. If you get the public opinion, you get those connections that permit organic holes stick together, collide apart, many non cooperative centers of gravity. <coughs> <coughs> You've isolated the constituents one, one from another. And so his whole concept, the center of gravity, which we use, we're going to go after the guys for changing center of gravity. I don't know what to tell people are talking about. I said, What is that? And they said, Well, you know what it is. They said, No, I don't. Because I read Clausewitz and he's wrong. And I know you're using it. How many people here take physics? Anybody? 
The center of gravity is always is with the mass of concert to most instruments. <coughs> can be. It's not necessary. It may be. In a donut, the center of gravity is in a hole. In a hollow steel ball, it's where the steel isn't. So the whole concept is baloney. The way he said it. It could be. But because he did that, then he says, now we're going to use our effort and go against that center of gravity. Christ, that's mass smashing into mass by his definition, which is incorrect, unsuitable. Could be, but not necessarily. See, and that's why the center of gravity is a lot of the constant. And then we say, we're going to go after the guys who change center of gravity. And I, say, well, I don't know what the hell that is. What are we talking about? What is that? So, so, we're so if you're going to go after a center of gravity, if you can identify the center of gravity, I'm not using Clausewitz's definition, but let's use a true definition of center of gravity. In other words, those things that permit an organic whole to stay together, whatever they are, moral, mental, physical, and you want to find that things that allows them to retain their connectivity. And so if I can break down those connections and get everything flying off in different directions, now you've got many what I call non cooperers Each one's a little center of gravity not connected up to the other one. You've got many non cooperative centers of gravity. And then you scarf them up. You want to use it. But unfortunately, when you use that strategic center of gravity, they act like they know ahead of time, well, we know exactly where that strategic center of gravity is. You know, you're, you're, you're imposing certainty in an inherently uncertain process, is what I'm trying to say. Can you go back then yeah. uh, to what you talked about vulnerability in relation to the process? I think we went through that last night. Yeah, now the vulnerability, and I, I think it's a good <clears throat> way to look at it. Those kind of things that your adversary depends upon, you may not know whether one's better than the other. So these things look very important. We've assessed it, we got inside it, you know, where the sun sue, know your enemy, and all that sort of stuff, at least somewhat you know. We say, okay, these things, what he really depends upon, these allow him to do what he wants to do, whatever they are. So we should direct our activities against them. Once again, you got to be careful. He's probably also made an assessment. He's vulnerable there, so he's going to tend to protect those very heavily. And if there's <laughs> critical vulnerabilities, he's probably also made that assessment. He may not have. But you've got to figure he may have. Good possibility. So therefore... You don't want to go directly after the so-called critical vulnerabilities because that also may be strength smashing into strength. Instead, you want to exploit the weaknesses so you can expose those centers, those, those vulnerabilities, so that they become unprotected. Then you can take them. <clears throat> what if you don't have an option? Hmm? What if you don't have an option? You can't. Well, it's nice if you say there's no option because then you know that's 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 a that's you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You say there's no other option, so you got a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's my view. There's all kinds of options. Okay. Well, we'll have to labor in the 20th. You've got to think them through. In World War II, do we have any option in the Pacific campaign other than going straight out of the office? Yeah, MacArthur, he, you know, initially he was going to do island hopping. Remember, his initial concept was <laughs> island hopping, one after another. But the island Wait a minute, he was going to do island hopping, one after another, until eventually the idea was to reach the, Japan. Pretty soon they said, hey, this is, this is not such a good idea. This could take forever. So then he started doing leapfrog and cutting off those other things by cutting their lines of communication so they went into the vine. They couldn't do it. They went into the leapfrogging campaign. He's cutting their, he's, he's cutting their, you know, that, he's cutting that which they depend upon. In other words, they can't get outside nourishment, support, etc. It's kind of hard to play the game. Is that a center of gravity then? If you want to use it, I call it slow on the bill, you know. I don't like that word. You, you see, I'm ducking away from that word center of gravity. It's got too much bad baggage with it. It may be a, a center of gravity. But see, what they do is they want people, people, it's not so bad if you recognize there's more than one center of gravity. In other words, there's centers of gravity, depending upon the subsystems and all that kind of stuff, see. Because <clears throat> even when physicists or mathematicians use it, you know, they don't take the whole universe. Remember, they say, oh, well, this thing that we're going to examine, here's the center of gravity. There might be another one over here because of other things they examine too. Like I took a donut. But, you know, I could have, you know, put that in a larger concept and it'd be a different center of gravity. Okay, you know, it's in the hole. See, they're going to go after the strategic center of gravity. What would you might be able to identify that. But, sir, what would you call the will of the people, for example, in American <clears throat> aversion to protracted war? Would you call that a weakness, a vulnerability, or, you know, a center of gravity for the enemy to try and 
Uh, it is. It might be a center of gravity. But now I see the will, but see now you're taking something more abstract. You're not taking the uh, mass per se. You're looking at what what permits the people to have a center of gravity. What permits that? And since you want to use the term, you you, know, you used it. So now we're going to use that term. Before we're what permits a center of gravity for the people? In other words, the people you say we're going to go after the will of the people. So we're going to infer that that's a center of gravity. What permits that center of gravity to be? But if you don't understand what permits that, what you do to attack all the people? That doesn't work. That's bullshit. So it means you can't use the center of gravity concept. So if you're going to use that, you can do it. Then what permits that to go after that center of gravity? That's what I'm asking. You have to understand it. Mass, you know, mass understanding. Or, you know, well, well, so we got to ask what I do. Just go on the radio and say, hey, I'm going after your will. Surrender. I'm going to force you to cop it up. I'm going to cop it up. <laughs> I would say... Propaganda. There you go, sir. Propaganda. Propaganda. But you yeah. haven't. You, that, just because you got propaganda doesn't mean you have subverted their will. No. That, how would I go about doing that? Yeah, but what what is it you're going after? If you're going to use a national propaganda, consensus, a national agreement. That, how are you going to get after that national consensus? Well, for I'm example, like World War II, did we not have national, more or less, national consensus? It was the right war, the right time, the right places. Well, that was that for our own. own. That was that was only to solidify our own center of gravity. If you want to use that term, that was for us. But I'm talking about. Well, we're going to try to undermine the adversary center of gravity. We're trying to just solidify our own. How are we going to undermine his? The gorillas, the gorillas do it very well. The gorillas really undermine the centers of gravity very well. They figured it out. I'm giving you a hint. So we'll protract it to the third, protract it more. No, 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 you're not kidding. It's through, it's through the use of violence. It's, 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 That's the only part of it. Well, yes, sir, but it's, a dry, it's, it's, uh, it's our troops being put in positions where they commit atrocities and then the public... public but he wanted to go after the people center of gravity. And then, and then the, 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 given, <clears throat> the death that occurs on each side and then the publication of that death all roads to the national will. That goes back to the Constitution who starts out being the people. And that, you know, it's, it's, it's the use of violence on both sides, publicized by the adversary, which subverts ultimately, over time, the national will. May or may not. Well, the use of violence is not explained in a way that the people would accept. You know, show See, now, you might start to come up with what you want to do is if you want to subvert or pull apart a guy center of gravity, not the words I'm pulling apart, you want to find out what what are those bonds, those connections that permit that organic hole to exist. You know, people aren't glued together. There's certain, there's certain <clears throat> bonds or connections or rules of conduct, codes of conduct, as standards of behavior. You want to see what they what they are. Then what you do with the gorillas do, they do it very cleverly. They say, okay, now let's look at the leadership and see if they're abiding by those bonds. And then they prop, then we will use your word propaganda, and they show the mismatch. The leader says this, but here's what he's doing. In other words, they've got a mismatch between the rhetoric and the reality. And they bring it up. Not only that, they show where he's hosing people, scarfing off funds and all that kind of stuff. And he not only does, he does it under a situation where people are getting screwed. Remember, I talked about that last night. Under what circumstances can you ethics against somebody? It's when they feel like they're getting screwed, they're going to get very interested in ethics because I'm goddamn getting screwed. And so then you can develop as many non cooperative centers of gravity so they can't fight as an organic hole. And that's based on what? What's the quickest way you can destroy an organization? Anybody. A Marine should understand it right off the bat. What is it? Quickest way you can destroy an organization? Hmm? Go even deeper. How do you destroy morale? Mistrust. And when you. See these guys playing these dirty games, you're building mistrust inside the organization no longer can function as a whole. Mistrust and discord. You build that up and Christ is going to come unto you. Now, granted, you use violence as a part of doing that. I'm not saying that, but that's only part of it. And see, that's how they work. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go out in that nutrition campaign and just pile up body counts and we're going to surrender. That's probably going to make them madder than hell they want to be. <coughs> and that's why your leaders... And you people as leaders, or future leaders, as lower level leaders, you've got to set the example. You can't say one thing and then do another. Because your, your subordinates are observing you and they say, that dirty bastard, we got to do this, but he doesn't have to. And so if you're a leader, you've got to set the example. You've got to be tougher in yourself than you are on your own people. And if you're unwilling to do that, as far as I'm concerned, you should get the hell out of the Marine Corps, or any service. You should be tougher on yourself. Because they're observing you all the time. They're not going to tell you, they're because you know, they know you have authority. But they're observing you. In other words, can they trust you? And if you do that, that kind of stuff, there's, you can already sow bonds of mistrust. I mean, uh, not bonds, but disconnect bonds of trust. You'll be sowing mistrust. And that's what the girls, they put that game. And of course, you can exacerbate it with terrorism, but if you do terrorism wrong, you also can make it go the wrong way, which I'll talk about later on. We're going to get into some. 
Okay? And that's why I want you to, if you have a chance to hear my strategy pitch, because I get into that moral stuff very heavily. We get into this stuff, and I show you a different way you just pull the goddamn organization down around the socks. Everybody says, what the hell happened? All I know is it didn't work out too good. <clears throat> so why was the American well uh, subverted vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam? It's because our leadership was telling us one thing, and the people were coming back and telling us something else. You know, we're winning the war, and goddamn, we got the, we're going to win it by this time, and everything's going good, and Christ, in the meantime, we get Tet 68 and all this other stuff going on, and the guys are coming back and say, hey, this is bull. Now, you want know to help exacerbate that? The one-year tour. Because the guys are going over there and coming back, and what they're doing, they're spreading among their friends, so the whole thing just it, it, it builds up a groundswell. So, they found our strategic center of gravity. It was the will of the American people. And in a sense, we looked in the mirror and did it to ourselves. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time with that because we're going to get into some of it later on. But now let's go to World War One. Remember, <clears throat> we started way back, you know, the point of view, and we went back to Sun Tzu and came up to the present. And I want you to sort of keep track of these ideas. Remember, I said we break things down, put them back together, break them down, put them back together to find those invariants, those constancies, those kind of things that tend to hold up in the context of where we are. We want to know what they are because we can use that as a basis for getting at the other guy rather than him getting at us. Instead of saying, well, Clausewitz is our God, therefore, whatever he says is great, we're just going to go by him or Jomini or Sun Tzu or Rumpy Yump, whoever. So that's what we have to do. Okay?